Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Norris from Frostburg State University, and in this video I'm going to talk about cycloaddition reactions besides the Diels-Alder reaction. And we're going to cover 2 plus 2 cycloadditions and use that as a point to talk about selection rules for cycloadditions, and then we're going to talk about 1,3 dipolar cycloadditions and chelotropic reactions. But I do want to start off this video with a reminder of one of the most important types of cycloadditions, and that is the 4 plus 2 cycloaddition, the Diels Alder reaction. And I will be using the Diels Alder reaction uh, as a comp as to compare these other types of cycloadditions too as we go along. I need to say one other thing about the diels alder reaction, and it has to do with the uh, molecular orbital picture that we need to understand what happens in the diels alder reaction. So you can use molecular orbital theory to understand what's going to happen in the diels alder reaction. And so here are the uh, appropriate frontier molecular orbitals, the HOMO of 1,3-butadiene and the LUMO of ethene. And usually diels alder reactions occur between the HOMO of the diene and the LUMO of the dienophile, though that can, can be reversed. And when you redraw these orbital pictures in a way that makes them look more like the orientation that the molecules need to be in, we can see very clearly that we're going to get constructive orbital overlap between the appropriate orbital lobes on the carbons of the new, of the diene and the dienophile because they're going to line up symmetry wise. And so it's important to know that the Diels Alder reaction is so important and common because the diene the Diels Alder reaction is thermally allowed. Right, it's symmetry allowed under thermal conditions. We'll come back to this idea here in a moment. Right. You may wonder why other types of cycloadditions are less common. Like it seems like we should be able to draw uh, a perfectly good cycloaddition mechanism for two molecules of ethene or any other alkene really. and form a four-membered ring. This reaction is, well, number one, we're making a four-membered ring, so there's some angle strain issues. This reaction is actually difficult to do under thermal conditions, and let's talk about why. Okay. So, here I have the HOMO of one ethene molecule. Got, this thing has electrons in it. And I've got the LUMO of the other ethene molecule, an empty orbital. And for the bonding to happen here, these two things would have to come together with some kind of constructive overlap. And if I bring the, make those look like they're going to come together, we can get overlap at one position, but not at the other. The symmetry of these orbitals don't match, and so we're not going to get bonding under thermal conditions. But something interesting is going to happen if we switch to photochemical conditions. If we switch to photochemical conditions, now one of our molecules of ethene gets excited into the excited state. And what was originally the LUMO of the ground state becomes the HOMO of the excited state. And so, an ethene molecule in its excited state can react with an ethene molecule in the ground state, 
and this can give us the orbital overlap that we need because now the orbitals have different symmetry orientations and this reaction works at uh, this at, under photochemical conditions. Okay, so this leads to the idea of selection rules. Let me move some things down. Right, if we're talking about a system, a combination of 4n electrons, so an even number of electron pairs, these things are not allowed under thermal conditions but they are allowed under photochemical conditions. If we have 4n plus 2 electrons, so an odd number of electron pairs, these and th this is total electrons across both partner molecules. These are allowed under thermal conditions and disallowed under photochemical conditions. Right. And, and this is a symmetry thing. Now, I will tell you that there are some very creative chemists out there who have s uh, figured out ways to do certain kinds of 2 plus 2 cycloadditions under thermal conditions. And that's all really, really interesting. But these are exceptions, not necessarily the rule. Before we move on to talk about the 1, 3 dipolar cycloadditions, I want to share some interesting things about the 2 plus 2 cycloadditions. Right? These reactions tend to be stereospecific the way that other um, you know the way that other uh, oh shoot other um, cycloaddition reactions are. And we can kind of explain that again using molecular orbitals, I'm using the molecular orbital picture. So as these things come together, the, the alkyl groups are going to want to be away from each other. And as these the bonds come together, these are actually going to rotate so that the bonds form. They're going to rotate in a con-rotary fashion. So you know, one's going to rotate clockwise, the other one's going to rotate clockwise so that those bond forms. And we're going to end up with a structure where one group is down and one group is up, something like this. It is also possible, uh, if things are constrained in some way, to get different stereochemical outcomes. And so here is a really good example. Uh, and one of the reasons why um, prolonged exposure to UV light is bad for humans. Here are two cytosine molecules. Under UV irradiation, two cytosine molecules, and actually pyrimidine bases in general, can undergo cycloadditions. Because these molecules are constrained in their cyclic forms, they, they, they are limited to certain kinds of stereochemical approaches. And because the DNA base pairs tend to be stacked up kind of like a, a ladder, that double helix ladder, if these are attached to the same strand, they're actually stacked on top of each other. And the bond that forms between them is in fact, uh, or the, the cycle that forms between them, reflects the stere you know has stereochemical outcome that reflects that arrangement so all of the hydrogen atoms that are attached here I'm going to point in the same direction because they were all pointing in the same direction originally when the when the bonds formed It is also possible, if they're not on the same strand, to get a, to get a different stereochemical outcome. But it's always going to be sin or, or cis at, um, I apologize, something happened to my Zoom. It's going to be sin or cis at the uh, junction between the six-membered ring and the four-membered ring. But you could get this diastereomer. 
or you, you could get other dice there. Right? Right. And once this is done, your DNA, once this happens, your DNA is done. This is a, a this is damage to the DNA that, that your body needs to repair. And if you accumulate a lot of these, well, it's bad. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that leads to cancer and, and, and all kinds of problems. Right? So, let's take a step back and let's talk about a different kinds of cycloadditions now. Uh, one, three dipolar cycloadditions and then the chelotropic reactions. One, three dipolar cycloadditions use a slightly different kind of, of pairing, and in the reality is, is we're all, you're probably already familiar with one of these, depending on on the sequence of topics in your organic chemistry course. But if you have learned about the ozonolysis reaction, you are familiar with one, three dipolar cycloadditions. This is a 1,3, well, the first step of ozonolysis is a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition. There are other steps that happen uh, after this step, but the first step is a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition. And when we mean some, a 1,3 dipolar, what we mean is we've got this three-atom system that it looks like it's clearly nucleophilic on one end, and on the other end, it's electrophilic somehow, and so the mechanism for this cycloaddition looks like this. Right? We have one oxygen atom in ozone that could clearly be a nucleophile and attack the alkene. The alkene pi bond electrons can also be a nucleophile and attack over here, and the oxygen-oxygen bond breaks to move a, an electron pair onto the center oxygen. Note that the center oxygen is not the electrophilic oxygen. Uh, though it ultimately does accept an electron pair to become neutrally charged. Okay. It turns out that these reactions are uh, symmetry allowed through their molecular orbital picture. And so here is uh, a picture of the dipole Homo, so like the ozone homo. I don't have the ad I don't have specific atoms drawn in there because we'll see there are other types of atoms. And then this is the lumo, and the other the other component of this reaction is sometimes called a dipolarophile, like to make an analogy to the um, to the diels alder reaction. When you put those orbitals in a geometric arrangement that looks more like the way the reaction is going, and you, you have them correct here, you can clearly see that there's going to be the correct kind of uh, constructive overlap needed for this kind of reaction. And it's also worth noting that the total number of electrons here is 4n plus 2. There are actually four pi electrons in the in the one three dipole, and two pi electrons in the dipolarophile. So this is actually a six electron reaction, even though there are only five atoms. In addition to ozone, there are some other interesting kinds of, of molecules that can be used to purposefully make heterocycles, either from alkenes or alkynes. Ooh. I just want R, not rubidium. One of these is um, the so-called Huizgin cyclization, which uses an azide compound. So this is a, a three nitrogens in a row. One has a positive charge, one has a negative charge, kind of like ozone. And the outcome of this reaction is carbon, carbon, nitrogen, 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 double bond. And, you know, this molecule has a chirality center, so probably both enantiomers are formed. This kind of reaction can also work on alkynes, and if you do, you get an aromatic ring as the, oops, as the product. Just like with diels alder reactions, when an alkene, alkyne reacts and a cycloaddition reaction, only one of its pi bonds reacts. And so you get these, these really nifty molecules here. These are called triazoles. 
Um, and they have other kinds of interesting synthetic utility, and they're also common in the structures of drug-like compounds. The last kind of reaction I wanted to talk to you today about are chelotropic reactions. These are cycloaddition reactions that are like X plus one cycloadditions. Right, where one of the partners in the cycloaddition is just a single atom. So one of the earliest discovered variations or chelotropic reactions uses sulfur dioxide, which I'm going to draw poorly here, apologize, as the, the chelotropic partner. And you might look at sulfur dioxide and not realize that there's anything special about it. But sulfur dioxide actually has a lone pair on the sulfur. And it's kind of an interesting molecule that can be both a nucleophile and an electrophile. And my, my ability to draw this mechanism the way I kind of want is, is tricky, but this can actually, sulfur dioxide can actually react with things like 1,3-butadiene and form these sulfoxide. Uh, these are sulfones, these cyclic sulfones. Other dipole, other chelotropic compounds are things like carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon, ha carbon monoxide has um, a carbon atom with a lone pair. You know, this is one of the, the two resonant structures for carbon monoxide. But uh, carbon monoxide can be made to do reactions like this. So that's pretty cool. Um, and many of the carbon monoxide reactions get catalyzed by transition metals. You have some pretty cool stuff going on there. And then um, finally there is a, a useful reaction that is a 2 plus 1 cycloaddition. And this is the Simmons-Smith reaction. And then... And Oops, Smith is the name, so let's capitalize it. Simmons-Smith reaction. And the reactants in the Simmons-Smith reaction are a zinc-copper catalyst and diiodomethane. And the outcome of this reaction is a cyclopropane. So as you have probably seen cyclopropanes all around and wondered, how do you make these three-membered rings? Well, here is a way that you can do it. Uh, the reaction happens by the conversion of the diiodomethane, CH2I2, into what's called a carbene by reaction of zinc and copper. And the net effect is the zinc tears the two iodine atoms off of the carbon. Just carbon. Hydrogen. And we get something that ha is both electron deficient but neutrally charged. So this carbene has two electrons on it in the appropriate orbitals, but it's missing its fourth electron pair, so there are only six electrons here. There are actually different kinds of carbenes, and some of them have paired electrons, and some of them have uh, uh, unpaired electrons, and that can create different effects for the, the way that this mechanism works. But ultimately, carbenes can react with alkenes and form these three-membered rings in the Simmons-Smith reaction. And that's a pretty cool reaction. And really, honestly, this just uh, scratches the surface of some of the other cycloaddition reactions that are out there. But I wanted to give you a, a, a taste of these things because undergraduate courses tend to focus pretty heavily on diels alder reactions and, and leave some of these other things out. Uh, leave some of these other things out. So I uh, appreciate you sticking with me. Uh, thank you for watching. And. Uh,
this was probably my last video about Cyclo Edition. So if you're excited about this stuff, check out one of my other videos on maybe another paracyclic reaction or you know any other kind of organic reaction. Again, thank you for watching.